Ladies and gentlemen, let me call this meeting to order. This is the May meeting for the Ross Lampton and Zoning Board of Appeals. If you have not signed in the sheet in the back on the table, please sign in so we have your presence noted in the minutes. In case you've never been to one of our sessions, let me tell you how we operate so you can keep up with us. I will call each case by case number and case name. Staff will come to the lectern, give us the request and how the staff has viewed it. After they have presented it, there will probably be questions and or discussions among board members back to staff and amongst ourselves. Once we're satisfied we have heard that side, then I will ask if there's anyone here in support or if the applicant is here or someone representing the applicant is here and would like to speak. If so, please come to the lectern, give us your name and address for the record, give us the information you wish for us to take on revival. If there are multiple people in support, we would like to know you're here, but once the information has been given to us, if your thoughts have already been presented, please don't give them to us again to take up time. There will possibly be questions and or discussions should someone come to the lectern and we will take it all under advisement. Then I will ask if there are any persons here in opposition or if there are any persons here that have questions about what is being requested. If you have opposition or questions, please come to the lectern, give us your name and address for the record and give us the information you would like us to take under advisement. Once we have heard both sides and discussed it, then we will normally render a decision here today. However, it is in the prerogative of the board should they deem it necessary for parties to talk or information lacking. We can postpone for approximately 30 days until the next regularly scheduled meeting. <coughs> Okay, first case we'll call is Lowndes County case EAR 2015-07, Franklin Bailey. Yes. Okay, please let the minutes note that Ms. Flower has a conflict of some description that she is sitting in the uh, back of the audience and will not be participating. Good afternoon, members of the Zoning Board. My first case before you today is um, a variance request. Um, basically, this is an attempt to construct about nine homes on nine lots, as highlighted on the screen there. Um, the thing you would notice that all these lots are corner lots, and that's the reason for the variance. The lots average about 6,500 square feet in size, and it's the, the developer's intent to construct homes that are of the same housing product as the existing homes in the subdivision, which are roughly 2,500 square feet all on the roof. Um, I believe, Mr. Strickland, you were only one on the board back in 2006 when this section of North Bay came before the board and a variance was granted to the rear yard setback. It was granted conditionally, the condition being that the lot dimensions or the setbacks for the front and side yard had to be complied with. Um, staff looked at this particular variance and can understand um, the reasoning with corner lots. They are at a disadvantage um, with the other lots, um, particularly with the side yard setbacks. The side yard setbacks for the interior lots, not the corner lots, um, are six feet. Um, which the houses are required to be six feet off the property line. In the case of the corner lot, the secondary front yard has to be 23 feet um, instead of the six feet that the other yard, side yards are, are granted. Um, staff looked at this, they're trying to go from a, from a 23 foot setback to a 17 foot setback, which is a relief of about six feet. Staff didn't have any really problems with um, with the variance request. Um, there were some other options we discussed with the developer, um, but they, they were trying to get the same type of housing um, as with the existing lots. So with that, staff has recommended approval conditionally. Um, we wanted to follow the 2006 condition um, that Zone Board of Appeals placed on this section of, of North Bay, that being that 
the locks will comply with the front yard setback and the side yard setback. In other words, they couldn't come and ask for an administrative waiver or some type of relief for that primary front yard setback. So with that, you wouldn't have to answer any questions. Any questions from the board at this time? I can read the packet. They are, what we're trying to do according to staff, I guess, is we're going to try to maintain the rear yard as it was, the front yard as it was, and the secondary front yard, which is a side yard, you're talking about giving them an extra six feet? Yes, on that secondary front yard. So the only real variance is going to be on the secondary front yard, quote, side yard. That's correct. And <coughs> of course, the condition being that these houses have to have two car garages. Any questions, any discussion? No question. You said that all the houses out there are 2,500 square feet under roof. Right. Not here. That's correct. Was that part of the original uh, restricted covenants? That wasn't part of the original condition. I don't know whether the covenants required the houses to be 2,500 square feet. Is there anything to bind him to that now? No. Not that we can afford. that they were going to go bigger or smaller or smaller. both? Smaller. Mm -hmm. So in the lower to middle of 2000s, is the minimum that they can put in there? We don't have minimums in the UOBC. We don't establish minimums at all. And as old as that subdivision is, covenants are probably gone. Actually, the subdivision was um, recorded around 2005. I thought so it was older than that. Mm -hmm. No problem. So maybe the developer can, or the applicant can answer that question, are they bound yeah. by that 25? But they have to have a two-car line. That's the condition we're, we're um, suggesting. And as you can see, there is one lot. Um, and this was a question me and the applicant uh, on the corner of Summer Hill and there is a house there um, that there's some question of whether or not they need that 23 foot setback. Um, we wrote the approval for them to, to do it, so but there's been some question raised as to whether they need that setback. But that is not one of the houses, one of the lots that we're dealing with here. That one's already up. That's correct. Okay, any other questions or any other comments? Thank you. Does anyone here would like to give us any additional information? Good afternoon. Franklin Bailey, 1091 Ridge Road. And I am the person seeking to get the various pieces of property. I appreciate Carmela for her presentation. She basically encapsulated the whole thing for me. Uh, it is uh, what we're trying to do is to take the corner lots that you will see the, uh, the Plan is showing up there. There are actually 12 lots on one street, and none of them are built on except one. And that's, that's what Carmel also said. I think that he has possibly some encroachment issues there. But that's beside the point. Uh, but the reason those lots are still there, even with the relief that this board gave in 2006, the lots are still there because of the primary six foot setback on one side and 23 on the other only gives you about a 35 foot wide house and that just won't work with the two car garage implemented in what y'all did. And so what we're looking for is some relief to go down to where I put a 42 foot wide house on there around 1550 to 1600 heated with the two car garage. I found a couple of house plans that I can actually make that happen. And that's what we're trying to do at this time. Any questions, any discussions from anybody on the board at this time? Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else here in support that would like to give us information? Is there anyone here in opposition, or does anyone here have a question about what is being requested? I do have a question. Okay, let's 
just back up a minute, Holly. On this house size, are you bound to do a certain minimum square footage of Thirteen hundred is the minimum square footage. That is heated air on. That does not include front porch, garage, or back porch. All right. So what you, are you required to do under roof? There's no requirements under roof. It's all based on heated air. And what is the average size out there now? The houses run from 15 to 1700 heated area. So if you, if, if you take if you take 1500 and you put 440 square foot of garage on there, you're almost at 2,000 square feet there. Then with the front porch and rear porch, you're anywhere between two and 2,200 under roof. Not that you're bound, but I'm curious of house plans. You, you said you have two house plans yes, that sir. you can use on those corner lots. What size heat is square feet of that? 1550. So the houses are being tentatively proposed are going to be in scale with what's there. They're, oh, most definitely. They're, they're equal. That's why we came because to do the two car garage that was imposed in 2005 on a 35 foot wide lot wasn't going to happen. So we, I've dug deeper and found some stuff with a 42 foot width that I can make happen. And I'm going to back up if memory serves me. Part of the reason, if not the major reason, that we tried to, or we specified the two car garage was to have enough carport and enough drive to park cars so they weren't parking all over the streets and all in the grass and the yards and such as that. And that's that's why we put the two car garage to try to alleviate congestion. And that's correct. That color makes the neighborhood yeah. Well, if, if I can. If I can actually add this too, with the corner yards that we'll be putting on the houses, if you look at the house from the street, it will not be a garage. We will have actual windows on the front facade, so actually will look like a nicer house rather than one you drive straight into if you will. Okay. I think the facade will be really nice on. So, so the driveway will be on the side, side yard where the 17 feet. That's correct. Is. That's correct. And I believe I did I show that on the, my rendering that I did for you, Ms. Gordon. There it is. Yeah. Well, I didn't show it, but I, or did I show it? It actually will be a custom side yard entrance. So, like the front and side will be uh, finished all the way across the windows and everything in the garage. Okay. Any other questions or discussions from the board at this time? I have a question. Yes, is the uh, section nine of the subdivision is that uh, still subject to the restrictive covenants, homeowner association? Don't know that I can answer that question. Are you asking Carmel or Phil? It is, yes. All right. And that would set out what the minimum square footage is going to be anyway. Yeah. So you would have to follow those rules and regulations. That's there are records so. Well, if I want to go pull a permit, they're going to tell me anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think that answers Nancy's question. Okay. Uh, we had no one in opposition with any contact in your office, Ms. Carter? Yes, sir. There was a number of calls, but more inquiries. Um, they thought multifamily development was going on. But after we told them it was single family, they were okay. Okay. Any other questions? Any other discussions before I call the question? Would somebody step out and give me a motion on this request? Criteria to ensure conditions. And with the conditions that were staff recommended. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, recommendation motion by Ms. Holly to grant the request as presented with the stipulations from staff concerning maintaining rear yard and primary front yard setbacks and and two car garage citing D and G. Do I have a second? I have second. a second, Mr. I'm sorry, I was looking his way. <laughs> Mr. Call, all in favor, please raise a hand. Unanimous, good luck with it. Make it look good, please. Okay. The next case we've got is Lowndes County VAR 2015-08. Rodney Canary. Henry, okay. Yes, sir. This 
last county request is an attempt to divide property using a set of regulations that were meant for larger tracts. Those set of regulations being family ties. Basically, um, with the adoption of the OVC, the Board of Commissioners um, adopted provisions for families to divide properties for their siblings, um, for their heirs, without going through the rezoning process. Um, but with some stipulations. For example, if you were in an area zone EA, which requires minimum five acre lot size, you can subdivide and create up to five one acre lots, but the remnant has to be at least a minimum lot size for that zone district. In this case, we have a legal non conforming lot, it's a two acre lot, and the applicant would like to sub subdivide her property into two one-acre lots. Well, in doing so, using the family ties, in doing so, there's two regulations that she will not meet. And one of those regulations is that of lot width. The EA zoning requires your lot to be at least 210 feet. And she also will not meet the remnant um, requirement of being five acres because the lot is already non-conforming. Staff looked at this. There was actually two options. Another option that was available to the applicant, they could have applied for rezoning to R1, um, which would have been risky. Um, the variance is also risky. So they chose to go the variance route. Um, staff looked at this. It was some, some debate on whether you know we should do this and start a precedent. Um, but staff ultimately recommended approval because um, there are adjacent lots to this property that supported the uh, family ties, land division, and what they're proposing will not be out of scale with what's already going on or what could happen as a matter of life. So with a split vote, staff recommended approval, citing criteria being the standards. Any questions, any comments from the board at this time? question how, how did this lot come to be it was a uh, it was I hate to use the term grandfathered in but it's, it was created prior to the five acre rule it's already in place and one of staff's concern um, was that you know this is kind of a backdoor way of getting something done uh, if you want to look at it that way and smaller lots are just not afforded, you know, rights that larger lots are afforded. But ultimately, staff didn't see a problem. Any other discussions? Any other questions? I can miss Charlie. Is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm old and gray headed. Confused. <laughs> Is there anyone here to speak in behalf of this request? Old habits are hard to work. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Rodney Terry, 27 East North Street, and um, I'm representing the, uh, the landowners. Uh, no one answer any questions yet. You have anything that you want to add? Pretty to much, she summed it up. This is the summed it up, um, and we are everything is already in place. Uh, all um, houses are currently on the property. Set the tanks are in place. Wells in place. Okay. Any questions? Any discussions from the board? Thank you very much. Is anyone here in opposition or does anyone here have questions about what is being requested? Any contact to your office? None. Any discussion, ladies and gentlemen? So straightforward. Can I get a motion on this request? A motion that we grant this variance citing D of the standards. We have motion. Dr. Housel to approve the request as presented using criteria D. Second. Second, Ms. Hobby. All in favor, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Good luck with it.
Okay, we have reached the end of the Carmella show. <laughs> now we get the Tracy show. Okay, next case we'll call City Case. APP 2015-02, Fairway Outdoor Advertising. Thank you, Chairman and Board. We have a request from Fairway Advertising. It is located at 807 West Hill Avenue. It's on Highway Commercial. There is currently about a 7,200 square foot building on the lot. It's utilized currently as a church. The applicant is proposing to replace a sign face. I don't know if y'all went out to visit the site or not. Um, the Bradford Pairs are doing a good job of camouflaging that pole out there. But there is an existing pole, which is right in there, that was altered. The face was altered, was removed in order to construct the underpass. The applicant would like to place the face back on and extend the height a little bit. This hole is currently 30 feet, and the applicant would ideally like to raise it to 60. That's what they're asking for a variance for. They're proposing to decrease the face from, let's see if I can get my number right, from 378 square feet to about 250 square feet. So they want to make the sign face smaller, but the height taller, if that makes sense. They would by right, be able to go and place the sign at the 40 feet, 30 feet plus a 10 feet base, so a total of 40 feet from grade to top, and 378 square feet by right. However, the reason they're in front of you is because they want to make the sign tall. Signs in the Highway Commercial District are ordinarily capped at 24 feet from grade to top of sign in single tenant facilities or single tenant facilities. Combine that with the fact that they're in the historic district, and the historic district allows eight feet tall signs in for the historic district. This did go in front of HPC last night and was approved to go from that 40 feet to a cap total of 50 feet. So they are approved to go through the HPC for a total of 50 feet. Now, planning and zoning staff. And there's the sign schematics, 60 foot from top to grade. We did a series of drive-bys and took some photos of 40 feet, 40 feet, um, 40, sorry, 45 feet, 50 feet, and 60 feet. We took pictures of both 45 and 60 feet and included some of those in your packet. We wanted to be able to better see what, what the 45 and 60 looked like, so to speak, when you were in different areas near the overpass. We've got 40 feet, 45 feet tall on the left, 60 feet from about the same angle. We've got 45 feet, 60 feet from about the same angle. And going over the overpass, 45 and 60. We felt like 45 feet may not be as visible as ideally should be able to. 60 feet was a little bit tall. We wanted to balance visibility with the historic nature of the historic district. So staff did a staff recommended for approval for 50 feet with a cap of 250 square feet for the area. So we recommend for 50 feet tall from grade to top of the sign and no bigger sign things than 250 square feet. Matt, would you like to have anything? I moved up here so I could play Matt White with the images so Tracy would have to run back and forth. But right. Just wanted to add a couple things on the history of it. Um, we all know that the DOT overpass project took a long time. Um, the OT acquired additional right-of-way around the overpass. Um, some of the signs were purchased as part of that. This sign was affected, but it was not purchased. Um, it still remains on private property. 
However, the sign being up high already, barely close to the overpass, um, the OT requested permission for the non-performing sign top to be removed temporarily uh, for fear that the cranes working on the overpass construction might accidentally hit the sign. So they wanted at least that part out of the way. And we agreed um, that the conditional license was a non-performing sign, that the sign simply be put back the way it was, the same height, same size. And that's how we left it. Um, no one knew at that time just how much higher the overpass would be next to the sign. We knew it would certainly be a height difference there. But how to quantify that was a, a very much of an unknown. Um, so the company is now wanting to put the sign back, but because the overpass is sort of right there at the top of the old pole, they want to go a little bit higher um, and also make it a little bit smaller, uh, partly because of the property line now being closer to the pole. Um, the question becomes, all right, stack can go on with a little bit higher because of the bridge, but that's, of course, not the only part of the road. But the question is, how high is high enough, or how high is reasonable? And that's why we ran the different scenarios. Uh, we took photographs of 45 and 60. Tracy took pictures. I took pictures. Uh, James Horton, historic preservation planner, also went out and looked. And we have a series of pictures in your packet, plus the ones that Tracy put on the screen. Um, on the screen, she did, does it as a comparison of the same approximate location, 45 versus 60, in your packet. We give you a series of 45 foot tall pictures versus 60 foot. Our initial impression when we saw the 45, uh, particularly coming from downtown, coming from the east, heading west, 45 seemed to be right at a good height. Good visibility, but not terribly high, um, a little bit higher than what was there. But then we noticed coming back over the overpass going east toward downtown that for a good part of the approach coming up the bridge, like where Tracy's pointing, she's now ran away. You can see the top of the bucket truck, and the top of the bucket is where the height is measured from. Um, this is the city arborist bucket truck that goes out to trim trees. It can actually go up over 70 feet. Um, so we had him with a tape measure, and the bucket is directly over the pole. So we wanted to get an accurate measure and an accurate location. So as you see in the picture on the left, the 45 sort of gets lost on the edge of the bridge. Now granted, that screening that's there is not completely opaque, particularly when you're moving. You can see through it and just add sort of a gray tone to what you're trying to look at. But like you see um, some of the other pictures, as you're approaching the bridge from the west, you can see the sign pretty clearly because your angle of view is different. It's some interesting geometry with the curvatures of the bridge. And of course, from their point of view, you know, if you're long distance from the sign, you can't read the copy that's on there. So you've got to be within a certain range. Um, so the concern was that too high becomes really obtrusive, particularly from distances away from the bridge, particularly from the downtown view shed. And so we thought, well, 45 is too short, 60 is definitely too tall, so something in between. We thought 50 might work. So we had them reset the bucket at 50 feet. Uh, we had already been out there for just over an hour or two and rain that day. We had imposed on our landscape people, I think, a little bit much. So we tried to speed it up, and we opted not to take pictures, but we wanted to do a drive-by around the loop just to see. And 50 seemed to be right where it needed to be, a little above the 45, but not too high to be obnoxious. So that's what we're recommending is the cap of 50. The 45 feet is above the fence. It's just your angle of view when you're below the curve coming from the west, from the east over the bridge, you're coming up the hill. Right. So you're not looking level, you're looking up a little bit. Right. So you have to look up over the rim of the bridge. A good frame of reference, for those of you who have been out there, is the top of the wall. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much at the top of the pole. Where it is now. Where it is now. Oh, and the pole is right at 30 feet. We measure the pole itself. Um, the, there's a very tall electric pole to the east of there that's pretty wide, sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, we didn't measure it with a tape measure, but from eyeball at the bucket level, we think that pole is at 55 feet. That kind of gives you an idea of frame of reference for those of you been out there. Um, and it's a pretty big pole. I guess my question is, I know this sign face is 
250 square feet, what is the distance from the top of the sign to the bottom of the sign? The sign itself is 10, the panel is 10 feet high. Okay. And there's a schematic in your packet, and I wanted to point out that is not to scale, mm -hmm. because they're, what they're showing is a total height of 60 feet, mm -hmm. but the sign head is 10 feet, and there's a lot more distance between the bottom of the sign and the ground than what that scale is showing you. Okay, if you're, coming, if you're coming from the west, headed east, in that first photo, and there's a sign at 45 feet, well, we're really talking about 50. Okay. Will it give clear view of the sign face? Okay. Light up here. Okay. This right here is at 45 feet, and this is near the crest of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, the sign pole is just east of the mm -hmm. crest. So the crest is right over the railroad track. Right. Um, so that's 45 feet, and the guy standing in the bucket is or standing at bottom level, and he is almost six feet tall. So 50 feet is above. Okay? So even at the worst angle of view, which is up here, you're still going to see the top of the sign very clearly. The bottom portion of it might be partially obscured through this netting, but you can still read it. I mean, as we pass through, we can see the entire bucket very, very clearly at 50 feet, and the top of it without any. But a short distance to the east and a short distance back to the west, the entire bucket and then some is plainly visible above this. And that would be at 50 feet? That's at 50 feet. When we drove this at 45, which is what you see in this sign, this was obscured for a pretty good distance in terms of the bucket and kind of gets 10 feet down. And particularly when you get back a little ways, you're not able to see through the fencing because you have too sharp of an angle. It really does hide it. And at that point, the sign really does need to be above the fencing. And that's also probably the optimum distance when you read the sign. A motorist is going to read the sign as they go by it at 35 miles an hour. They're going to be a few hundred feet away. So that's the angles we were shooting for. Uh, 50 feet gets it above this, even down the hill a little ways, and particularly on down the hill. Well, 60 just towers, I and mean, it's higher than the electric pole. And in all honesty, like Matt and I kind of talked about how we thought this would kind of play out, how 45, 50, and 60 would look. We pumped it up at 45, thought that was going to be great. You can see that there were some visibility issues. Bumped it up, okay, we need to try 60. 50 is not going to work. Bumped it up to 60, and it looked almost like a high rise in the middle of downtown. Felt like that was a little bit tall. Bumped it down to 50, and 50 was almost right on the right. And then when the bucket first went up, and we're standing beneath it, looking up at 45 feet, going, gosh, that's high. And we really thought that even might be too high. And then when we got to the east side, turned around and looked, and said, no, yeah, that looks about right. And we sort of took different vantage points, and I thought it 45 is it. Until we got to the other side and came back toward downtown and realized that does, it works for every angle of that. And then we tried 60 to go to the other end of the spectrum to see, and it was, in our view, clearly too high from all angles, particularly from downtown. So we thought somewhere between, and we ran 50 just to see. And if 50 didn't work, we would have done a few more just to see. But 50 seemed to be pretty good. And 50 is what historic. HPC has approved it. Their certificate of preference granted her variance, if you will, is a pretty extreme one. Um, this is on the edge of the historic district, by the way. It's not right in the middle. The railroad track is the boundary. Um, and their sign regs don't allow signs over eight feet tall as a freestanding sign. So it's already big nonconformity there. But since it was a change to a structure in the district and it exceeded the design guidelines, and this is a billboard sign, not an on-premise advertising bill. Well, it may recall in city regs, billboards are simply defined as size. Um, right now, the sign that was there is not conforming was a billboard because it was 300 square feet or greater. And actually, they're proposing to drop it down to 250, but it actually takes it out of that category. And it's just a regular freestanding sign rather than a billboard freestanding sign. 
but it's still a freestanding sign subject to height limitations and sizes and things of that nature. Well, what, what I was trying to do was they can advertise whatever entity is down. They can advertise anything they want. Right. But right there, more than likely. Regardless of how it's classified. Well, but more than likely, this is not an advertisement for that particular use. It's going to be a billboard type advertising. You mean an off-premise Off-premise type advertising. And I'm, what, what I'm looking at is at some point in the future, there's another couple of buildings down there that want to say, hey, we want to do the same thing. And right. at that point, and then they'll need their own approval from HVC and their own variances if they want to exceed the 24, 35 foot right. height. But yeah. they, but they gonna come running in and say he did it. I won't. They might. They might. The difference is here you've got a grandfathered in non-conforming sign that was already too tall and certainly too big. Correct. Right. And that is actually reducing in size pretty significantly and going up 10 feet. What can they put up right now? The sign that was there before, which was at top maximum height of 40 feet. Yeah, but they can't do that because obviously you can't see it. They wouldn't do well, it. Well, they could do it. They could do it, but they, they wouldn't want to do it because no one could see it. Correct. That's so why they have to get the variance to go up to 50 at minimum. Correct. That's why they're here. So what, they what is your, what, what's y'all's thoughts on the aesthetic? I mean, this is a brand new overpass. You want to look at the landscape and I, you have to look at the sign? I'm sure even if they were to put it back as it was, our phones would start ringing because it has been gone for a few years, um, even though the pole has remained. And that was one of the conditions we had with DOT, that the pole remained. Um, so it was still planted in place, still part of the sign. Um, it is a concern because, one, it's on the board of the historic district. It's certainly a gateway into downtown, sure. which is why we want it to be, you know, at least somewhat conservative on the height, not go too high or be too obtrusive to the view coming into downtown. But we also have to recognize it is grandfathered in as it was. Why did the DOT buy it? During because the they did not need the land that the sign sits on. Mm. And that was the only one? That was the only, only one in this area. There were some signs on the north side of the road that were on the land that was purchased. Yeah. So all the structures that were there were removed. That did include a few sign phones. Go ahead. Um, just to be clear, at 50 feet, there is some point when you're coming from the west to the east where you can see the whole sign face above the screen. Oh, yes. Okay. Um,
lead into downtown Valdosta and what is offered there. I mean, I have a feeling they're going to be reading signs to people that are going to be seeing these coming into our city that need to know where certain things are. Maybe I didn't make that very clear. I mean, maybe I didn't explain that. But, I mean, I was just looking at the signs, South Georgia Medical Center. Sure. Any other questions, discussions? Is there anyone here from the applicant side who would like to give us any additional information? Well, I'm Bart Holt from Fairway Outdoor, 369 Enterprise Drive. I'm just here to answer any questions. Uh, I think what the city did here with their bucket truck is a lot better than what we did with a pole sticking up <laughs> with a little flag on top trying to see it. And um, as I told the Historical Society, Board last night. The 50 foot, if these pictures, which it the big shows, that's all we're looking for is to be able to see the sign so that the people we sell it to, you know, get what they're paying for. All right. Is there a reason y'all asked for 60 foot? Well, I mean, again, what we did is we, we had a pole, and our pole was only 50 feet and it just had a little handkerchief on it and we were riding over. And even at the 50 feet or even at the 60 feet, as you're coming up the hill, there's as Matt, there's a there's a section there that, that you lose the sign. But I'm not sure you could get it high enough that you would not lose the sign because of the fencing. When you're looking through that fencing at a certain angle, it's just like looking at a, a sheer wall there. And part of it too depends on which lane you're in. If you're in the right lane closest to the fencing, then that angle is even more sharp and you're having to look up into the sky to get above it for a short stretch. It's a little bit better when you're in the left lane you're coming out of the town. You're a little better angle and you catch full view of the sign a little faster. Now, when you're in the east, the height that it's at, you would probably see it all the time. You see it very clearly when you round that curve by the newspaper publishing building. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a study to show um, the distance from a sign that people usually are reading that sign? Well, I mean, there have been some studies, and you know, and it, it all depends on the speed of the traffic and, and all that. I can tell you that when you're on the highway and what the, the DOT has looked at as far as the only thing I can relate it to is where they allow you to open up a window through the vegetation. They look at a 500 foot window. So anywhere from 500, 400, 300 feet is where you know people see the sign and read the sign. When they get closer to that, you know, they're looking past the sign on down the road. And the other variable is the signs of your font. That words on there, the letters are two feet tall versus six feet tall. Yes. Makes a big difference. Fighting. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry. Um, in the recommendation that staff has made, if we approve this, would Fairway or the owner of that pole be able to revert back ever to the original 30 foot with the 375 foot. Once the sign is changed, any grandfather says it had previously goes away once it's a new sign put back. Um, so we're recommending approval of an increased height of the sign at that location to go no higher than 50 feet, and, but also subject to the condition that the size be reduced to no more than 250 square feet, which is what we're proposing. The question really is just how high. Yeah, and, and Two reasons that we propose for the smaller signs is again because of the, the right of way there and also to utilize that pole when we did the engineering you can't put as heavy a load when higher you know the wind so we reduce the size just to make sure the engineering part works. Okay. They don't want to dig up and rebuild their foundation. Any other questions or discussions? Is this a digital billboard? No. It's just a static poster for this. Anyone else? 
assuming we have nobody else in the audience, we don't have anybody else in support, and assuming there's nobody else, I'm assuming we don't have any opposition. Was there any opposition to your office that we should be aware of? We only received one phone call, and that was wondering, that was wondering what the red block sign public hearing notice was. They had no questions other than that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any other discussion before I call the question? I make a motion that we approve the variance and follow the staff recommendation at 50 feet and the 250 face, face sizes. We have a motion from Ms. Portman to grant the request as presented at 50 feet, 250 face maximum. Those are maximums, right? Maximums. Maximum. Per staff recommendation, do I have a second? I have a second. This was a yeah. I have a second. All in favor, please raise a hand. Unanimous. Good luck with it, sir. Was you? I voted against it. I'm sorry. It was not unanimous. You was a thinker opposed. <laughs> I did not see your hand, and I didn't ask for opposition. That's a data. Is anybody in opposition? <laughs> well, your vote is not unanimous. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, sir. Good luck with it. Okay, uh, that concludes the business part of the agenda pretty much. Under other business, we have approval of minutes. I didn't see anything in them. Does anybody else see anything needs to be modified? Can I get a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Some motion, Mr. Alvarado. Second. Second, Mr. Paul. All in favor, raise a hand. Unanimous. Uh, the only other thing that I penciled in, unless I missed something, did you not put an application in? I decided to uh, let someone else have the opportunity. Okay. That's, that's fine. I just went to open the paper up today and started reading. I said, oh, here's Laverne's name. And I got to look at it. No, Laverne's name is not taken. Yeah, but I just wanted to tell everyone that it's been a pleasure working with you. Well, we appreciate and your time that you gave us. with you all. And I want to give someone else a wonderful opportunity. It's been a pleasure to see. Appreciate your time and effort. Okay. Uh, any other new business, old business, anything we need to bring up? Can we get, take a picture of ourselves since we're all here before the burn leaves? Sure. Anybody else who's got? Let me run and get the paper. I mean, just take one of my phone here. This is fine. This year, you make me fancy. Proof of last year.